on his 19 hours GMT. Hello, good evening to you. Welcome to News 360. And it's live money news up here at the Sawari. My name is Alpha the Country. And I am Solis Rose Quarte coming up in the bulletin this evening. Headlines is brought to you by and the Kofuado suspends Upper West Regional Minister Al Haji Suleiman Al Hassan over attacks on Regional NADMO coordinator. And three suspected armed robbers gunned down in a gun battle with police at Wager. Accra Commercial Court stays proceedings in case against five individuals of NCA, including former board for causing financial loss to the state. And in business tonight, fuel prices to remain stable if government applies price stabilization mechanism. And on the international front, three of Kenya's largest private TV channels remain off air despite an order by the country's high court suspending a shutdown. Well, all these and more coming up, including sports and entertainment, in the next 60 minutes. Now let's start off with our first story where the president has suspended the Upper West Regional Minister Al-Haji Sulemana Al-Hassan for allegedly shielding thugs who attacked officials of NADMO in the region. Now staff of the National Disaster Management Organization who accused the Minister of Protecting Hooligans have vowed not to work again until the attackers, believed to be members of the governing New Patriotic Party, are arrested. Now a statement from the presidency said Al-Haji Suleimana Al Hassan has been suspended with immediate effect. And also, the statement added that it was signed by the Director of the Communications of the Presidency, Eugene Ahin, and also said that the President, Akufuado, reiterates his commitment to the application of the laws of the land, which must occur without fear or favor, affection or ill will, and without recourse to the political, religious, or ethnic affiliations of any citizen of the land. The Deputy Upper West Regional Minister Amidu Ishak is to act as the Regional Minister in the interim pending the conclusion of the investigations. We're going to go on to uh, Skype very shortly to engage uh, a bit on this matter. Now, I've been joined via Skype now by uh, uh, Adam Bona. He is uh, the uh, chief executive officer of the uh, securities warehouse, a security analyst, to help us understand it a bit better. Mr. Bona, good evening to you, if you can hear me. Hello, Mr. Bona, good evening to you. Good evening, I can hear you. Good evening and good evening to your cherished list uh, Good evening. I can hear you. Good evening. Uh, well, I, I, I can hear you, but um, it's a bit faint, though. But then, uh, with this particular move or uh, decision by the president to suspend the appointment of the minister comes at a time when questions have been raised about the political will to deal with this political vigilantism across the country. What would be your assessment of, of this decision to, to ask the, the minister to step aside for investigations to go on? Well, uh, thank you very much and good evening to your cherished viewers. Uh, I think kudos to the president. I think the president uh, has acted decisively. He has, he has acted swiftly. Uh, I, I guess uh, we, the whole country is up in arms uh, when it comes to security in this country. Uh, looking at what has happened in Kwabinya, what has happened all over the country. And so it is a time where the, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces would have to act decisively when issues like, you know, hoodlums taking over a state property and destroying, uh, you know, the properties in there and, you know, criminally beating people. Uh, you, you want to see him act decisively. And I think, rightly so, I would, I would uh, give him uh, nine out of ten for the, the, the action the president has taken. Now, but it would, it, from your assessment, would this decision be a potent signal to, to uh, other NPP-affiliated uh, vigilante groups that have been involved in act of hooliganism and in discipline in other parts of the country? Exactly so, because I think this is the first time this is happening uh, for many years. This is the first time 
we've seen, uh, you know, a president, uh, you know, the president take, you know, this type of decision. And so I want to believe that uh, apart from the, the vigilantes, apart from the, the political vigilantes, uh, the political, you know, leaders, the regional ministers, the MMDCs would also, because, you know, they, they, the truth is that the MMDCs, these are people who are in charge of DISEC and RECSEC. And therefore, uh, when you go to the regional level, the district level, and the rest, uh, usually they somehow have power over the police commander. And if you look at what actually took place, it's, it's unfortunate. And I suspect the regional minister didn't know uh, that uh, what he was doing was not right. Uh, I mean, I'm sure he didn't know what he was doing wasn't right. And if you know the history of the Upper West, uh, the Upper West somehow has always treated issues of this nature there is in, in the language. I mean, they will say to Jabuyin, what it means is that we are all one. And therefore, issues like this would have to be settled at home. But, you know, issues of criminality shouldn't be settled at home. And so I want to believe that uh, from, from that antecedent where issues of criminality, issues that borders on crime, usually within the region, largely are settled at home. It looks like that is what might have made the regional minister take this decision. But unfortunately, the timing is bad. And looking at what has been going on around the country, he shouldn't have done that. And I would, I would hope and pray that other regional ministers, DCEs, MMDCs, you know, would take a cue from what has happened so that they don't become, uh, you know, we, the, the president wouldn't suspend them or kind of, you know, uh, punish them. But it also boils down to the fact that the police is not independent. We don't have an independent police service in Ghana. And the truth is that if you have a professional police, because these people are arrested, according to Okay. Regional minister said, leave them, I'll bring them to you. <laughs> That's a pretty interesting point yes. that you concluded. Well, Mr. Boda, thank you very much for your time this evening. And I'm, I'm really grateful. That, that comes to the point where many who call on the IGP to also uh, step in uh, to ensure that the police are able to effect the arrest despite any resistance from any political uh, figure in whatever region. But three alleged armed robbers have been gunned down during a gun battle with the police at Wager. Now, the deceased have attacked the uh, the undercover police patrol team in an attempt to snatch the vehicle amidst firing off uh, some gunshots. Now, viewer discretion is advised. The three, Kwame Salsa, Jaru, and Joe, the police alleged, have been on their wanted list for varying crimes in the greater Accra and central regions for the past three months. The alleged gang of armed criminals were noted for high profile robberies and car snatching in and around Bawe. Botiano, Kokrobite, and Kaswa. One of the latest crimes, according to the Accra Regional Police Commander DCOP George Alex Mensa, was an attack on a Range Rover, which they failed to drive away due to the security restriction on the vehicle. However, the police said the criminals made away with some valuables and an unspecified amount of money. DCOP George Alex Mensa said luck eluded the gang when they mistook the police operation car to be a civilian vehicle in the wee hours of Thursday, February 1. The police returned fire, killing all three in the process. A locally manufactured double barrel pistol with nine rounds of BB cartridges, a foreign pistol with five rounds of 9mm ammunition, five mobile phones and an iPad belonging to the owner of the Range Rover were found on the deceased. We want to sound this warning or note of caution to all those who are engaged in similar activities that the police will not sit down for them to perpetrate this crime on consent. We are now going to march them foot, boot for boot and, if possible, get them out of the system. The regional police commander, DCOP Alex Mensa, also urged the public to support the police deal with criminal elements. Now, the National Disaster Management Organization has cordoned off four of the Tema Kaiser Flats buildings, declaring the place a danger zone. The occupants have been forced to evacuate from the buildings uh, to pave way for a demolition exercise by the Tema Development Corporation. 
over 400 occupants will be evicted to pave way for the demolition exercise. A Tama High Court ruling in 2013 ordered the eviction of occupants to make way for the redevelopment scheme planned for the township. However, in July 2017, the recovery of the blocks was aborted due to some interventions. The occupants later went to court to plead for more time. Consequently, the court obliged and ordered them to vacate the building by the end of January 2018. Although the structures to be demolished have been declared unsafe for human settlement, sources at the Kaiser Flats told TV3 majority of the affected residents had been compensated some three years ago by the TDC and some had already moved out. Others were still around, insisting they had nowhere to go. Spokesperson of the affected residents, Isaac Lomoti, pleaded with TDC to give them some more time to vacate the place. NADMO coordinator Nana Kwesiajiman Prempe said it is necessary to evacuate the residents to avert a potential disaster. Having done this uh, eviction, if you are not careful, very soon people will be coming in again. We need to spend energy money and others to come and do another eviction which you, you we do not want to wait for that so what we're going to do is as soon as possible we will do it because children will be playing around even though people are not after children you cannot prevent them from coming around to play what about if something happens so we need to do it now the five member ad hoc committee probing the cash for seat saga will finally lay its report in parliament on friday february 2 and to be debated next week tuesday spokesperson for the committee yabwa benga Samoa, says they could not receive certain documents to enable them complete the report on time he spoke with uh, parliamentary correspondent evelyn tengma you were supposed to present your report yesterday what happened um, we are still polishing it, uh, tying up a few loose ends. Uh, as I've had occasion to observe to uh, Sister Media House, a couple of documents we're expecting uh, delayed a bit, so it held the whole report up. And now we have our full complement of supporting documents. And um, we've gone through our drafts, and God willing, I believe tomorrow. We will lay it in the house. Was Didn't you know about that? Yeah, people were supposed to supply the documents at a time we believed they would be able to. And they were held up, not through our fault, but through those who were supposed to organize and bring those reports. So it's not a question of uh, me having promised the last time. So yesterday I have to be held to it. It's exigency, it's human uh, intervention. Majority leader did indicate that you will lay it tomorrow and then it will be debated on Tuesday. Why wouldn't it be debated tomorrow after laying it? Uh, the rules <laughs> are in, in that structure. But ideally, why not ask him majority leader? <laughs> you are the spokesperson for the committee. <laughs> yes, the rules, the way the rules are designed. You lay it and then we retreat, share copies of it, it's 48 hours, and then we debate it. Initially, the committee was supposed to have presented its report on January 24, but asked for more time. They were then given up to January 31, but could also not meet that deadline. The five-member ad hoc committee was set up to probe allegations by some minority MPs that some expatriate businessmen paid up to $10,000 to sit close to the president during the expatriate business awards ceremony held in Accra last year, December. Now still in Parliament and Member of Parliament for Subing Eugenichi has expressed worry over the recent secret recording of voice and videos usually being posted on social media. The lawmaker wants the country's laws on privacy and um, basically tri privacy uh, strengthened and its legislation crafted to punish offenders. With the proliferation of smartphones, recording of telephone and other conversations had become the order of the day. Almost each day, people are being subjected to secret recordings and even private video recording, which sometimes find their way on social media. The incidents of sexual or pornographic materials on social media, according to MPs, defiles the rights of the parties involved. Some members of parliament want people sensitized on the subject. We need to reiterate and give a strong condemnation where we need to draw the line between what is acceptable, what is the norm, 
and what is palatable to share with the public. And people have lost their lives as a result of this misconstrued sharing of data unintended for the public. I am in, in, in full support of this call that yes, there are some of the existing legislations concerning this matter, but there are no sanctions or penal regimes covering them when somebody breaches them. So it is important that as, as a house, we, we take a holistic view of matters because social media has become a very important medium of communication. Minority leader Haru Naidrisu says most Ghanaians are abusing the mobile phone and its usage. The best way to avoid being scandalized on this is self-discipline. Privacy must be protected and respected, but I'm afraid legislation may not be able to resolve it. We must just ensure cautious use of the mobile phone. The majority leader says the current situation is jeopardizing national security. What people do is a clear breach of Article 41. Legitimate interests of others and generally ref refrain from doing acts detrimental to the welfare of other persons. Clearly an obvious breach of Article 41. And we say we should fold our arms as a parliament and not do anything. Mr. Speaker, so there are matters that should concern us. The MP who raised the matter on the floor, Eugene Entry, wants a legislation crafted so offenders could be punished. I don't think a thriving democracy like ours needs this kind of culture and practice. It's very bad, it's unethical, it's cruel, it's crude, it's depravity. There are already probably laws or the statute books, but we must look at tightening the laws by having in place a very, a very rigorous, regimented punish, punishment system in place as a form of deterrence. All right, so a fellow of Imani, Ghana, has implored Parliament to annul the passage of the LI, which reduces the number of law students into the law school. Kofi Bento has threatened to proceed to the Supreme Court for proper interpretation if Parliament defies its petition. The General Legal Council has already presented before Parliament an ally to retain the existing criteria of allowing students to go through the Ghana Law School by writing and entrance exams. This, according to Imani, defies the directive of the Supreme Court, which compelled the General Legal Council to institute measures to absorb a large number of students. A fellow of the policy think tank, Kofi Bento, is of the view the General Legal Council is acting unconstitutionally. The General Legal Council should not conflate the Ghana Law School with professional legal education. So if there are constraints at the Ghana Law School, those constraints must not be said to be constraints on professional legal education in Ghana. And you have disenfranchised 3,000 young people who are qualified at the law to do the course. All you need to do is to make sure that you open up the writing of the bar examination to these people who have qualified and let them find their tuition. He argued if more lawyers are trained through a professional law education without going through the law school, it could address the unemployment rate in Ghana. We need lawyers at every level. Every state institution must have a lawyer. We will limit, you know, judgment deaths that way. Your institution needs a lawyer. Okay, you avoid so many troubles if you have a lawyer there. If lawyers were driving taxis, we have a better country. So, in fact, there is no reason why you should limit legal education in this country. We should expand it as much as possible. We have a teeming youth population, and they are very good. Currently, Imani, together with other civil society groups, have presented a petition to the Parliamentary Select Committee to annul what the General Legal Council brought before them. The senior fellow has threatened to seek the Supreme Court interpretation if Parliament goes ahead to pass the ally. There is always the room to go and try and resolve this thing at the Supreme Court. But I really do think that the parliamentarians understand this cause. Because you see, even at the policy level, there is no virtue in trying to limit legal education in Ghana. The law is not just a qualification, it is a vocation. I don't know how many lawyers you've seen who have passed out and be called as lawyers who consider themselves unemployed. 
A lawyer is employed just by virtue of being called to the bar. Now, an Accra commercial court has stayed proceedings in the case against five individuals of the NCA, including the former board for causing financial laws to the state. Now, this is to allow the Supreme Court to interpret Article 19, Clause 2, E and G, a report by Godfred Tanham. This was necessitated by the request of the lawyers of the defendants to compel the state to disclose to them documents the prosecution intends to rely on in the trial as well as the list of witnesses. Article 19, 2 E and G of the 1992 Constitution, which has been referred to the Supreme Court, states in part, a person charged with criminal offense shall be given adequate time and facilities for the preparation of his defense. The interpretation is therefore to seek answers to whether the accused persons are entitled to comprehensive trial disclosure, at what point it should be done, and whether the accused persons are entitled to all documents, including those that may not be tendered in. Justice Che Barfo stated in his ruling, there is no mandatory requirement in summary trials on the prosecution to provide a defense team with documents they intend to rely on before the trial. On defendants' requests to be given all documents that will be tendered in by the state, the court said that will put it in a prejudicial position and subsequently dismiss it. In the opinion of Justice Che Bafo, holding on to proceedings for the interpretation of Article 19.2 was the proper thing to do. He said both parties have taken rival positions on the provision and that should call for an interpretation at the Apex Court. The case involves the former Director General of the National Communications Authority, William TV, and four others who have been arraigned for allegedly defrauding and causing financial loss to the state over the alleged fraudulent $6 million contract signed between the NCA and Infralux Development Limited. Godfrey Tanam, TV3 News, Accra. Oh, no. Away from the cause, government is yet to decide when to lift the ban on small-scale mining activities in the country. A deputy minister for lands and natural resources in charge of mines, Barbara Otingesi, says the expected results for enforcing the ban has still not been achieved. It's been 10 months since government placed a ban on small-scale mining activities in the country. Initially, the ban was supposed to have lasted for six months, but the purpose for which the ban was placed, which is to restore water bodies to its original state and also protect the environment, was not achieved. The ban was extended and was expected to be lifted yesterday, January 31. We initiated a project, which is um, the multi-sectoral mining integrated project, which is a five-year project, which we believe that um, effectively implemented will bring and um, will eradicate um, the illegalities in our small-scale mining sector. So we have made some progress, but we haven't reached the point where everything is in place for the ban to be lifted. So once the project is launched, hopefully. Um, we can make a recommendation to the interministerial committee and then they can um, recommend to the president for the ban to be lifted. The minister explained piloting of reclamation has already been conducted at Chebi in the eastern region and the same could be replicated for dredging of the water bodies as component in the MMIP. As part of the implementation of the project to achieve the desired objective, district committees against illegal mining would be established in the various district to monitor the activities of miners. We are also um, going to audit all the companies in the small-scale mining sector. And once that is done and we look at those that have been operating in, in a proper manner and there are no issues, they'll be allowed to go back to work. Those that there are issues, they'll be given time to rectify those issues and then they also go back to work. A number of mining district officers have already received training from the Minerals Commission to enable them carry out their duties effectively in line with the implementation of the MMIP. Now, President Akufuado has renewed his commitment to foster the study of French among Ghanaian students. He made this firm commitment during a courtesy call on him by the Francophone ambassadors to Ghana at the Flagstaff House in Accra. Discussions among the two parties focused on creating opportunity for the study of French language. The Francophone ambassadors emphasized the contributions of other neighboring countries in the speaking of the language. President Akufuado 
indicated his firm belief to make Ghana a dual speaking country. The dream has to be like that Ghana becomes like Cameroon or like Canada, which are bilingual countries, uh, automatic bilingual countries where everybody speaks English and French. That would be the idea. The lead ambassador of the group was elated about their meeting with the president. He again commended the president for being the first sitting head of state to meet them. He spoke about their support to help Ghana facilitate the study of the French language. President Ekufuadu assured of government's willingness to deepen the study of the language. I think that anything that we can do to accentuate our relationship with the Francophone organization and with our brothers and sisters of the Francophone world and ECOWAS and generally in the world is something that we are interested in working on. You're still watching News 360. Good evening to you and thanks for staying with us. Time for business now with me, Nana Ikia Mensah-Brampa. And beginning with this evening, prices of petroleum products are likely to remain stable if government applies the National Petroleum Authority's price stabilization mechanism. Now, prices are expected to go up at the pumps by 2% for the first pricing window in February. But this will not happen if government intervenes. Brent crude oil prices on the world market went up by 2.76% from its previous average of $67.70 per barrel. Currently, price of Brent crude on the market is $69.57 per barrel. The city's marginal depreciation also contributed to this 2% increase expected to hit the market. With these factors, prices are expected to increase other pumps. From December 1st, 2017, uh, government kick-started uh, the price stabilization mechanism where the price stabilization and recovery levy is used to manage prices. So where prices are going up and government feels that uh, it should step in to make sure it doesn't go up so the consumer can have some respite, uh, government decides to intervene by stabilizing it or uh, ordinarily we say by using that fund to subsidize what the price will be. So if government decides to uh, apply the price stabilization mechanism this time around. That means consumers will be saved from uh, the eminent prices that are supposed to go up. Richmond Roxon, principal research analyst with the IES, says government intervention will, however, not be enough as this goes round to hurt profits of oil marketing companies. Sometimes government intervention is not enough. Uh, what it means is that this, the OMCs will have to swallow part of the cost. And already uh, some of them are complaining about uh, the cost that they are making losses uh, because of the, uh, the application of the price stabilization and recovery levy. Uh, most of them look at the larger OMCs uh, who, because of volume, sometimes uh, will decide to rescind their decision to increase. But if a relatively smaller OMC uh, with not much volumes, uh, when these decisions are taken, sometimes you get affected. By so let's see what happens at the pumps in coming days. But away from that, Ghana, Togo and 21 other African countries are pushing for the implementation of the Yamoussoukro Agreement for a single continental airline. Aviation Minister Cecilia Dapa disclosed this when the Namibian High Commissioner to Ghana, Charles Josop, called on her to announce the return of Air Namibia to Ghana. Part of the reason for Africa's underserved status is that many African countries restrict their air services markets to protect the share held by state-owned air carriers. African ministers responsible for civil aviation in 1999 adopted the Yamusukro decision for an open skies for Africa. It commits its 44 signatory countries to deregulate air services and promote regional air markets open to transnational competition. The decision was endorsed by heads of state and governments at the Organization of African Unity in 2000 and became fully binding in 2002. That notwithstanding, implementation has fallen short, according to the lead air transport specialist at the World Bank, an author of Open Skies for Africa report. Full liberalization of intra-African air transport services in terms of access, capacity, frequency and tariffs, the report suggested, would open up the continent and its diverse tourism sites. 
And this is what the renewed effort being championed by Togo seeks to achieve. We are a signatory to the Yamusukro decision and uh, it's 23 countries. Ghana is proudly one of them. And our president has always talked about connectivity within Africa. And this is what is going to solve that problem. The minister also welcomed the reintroduction of Air Namibia into the Ghanaian airspace. It's all in pursuit of our vision of making Kutuka International Airport the hub for aviation in the ECOWAS region. And now we are being sought after like a good bride. And Air Namibia is coming back. But had the challenges that led to the withdrawal of the Air Namibia from Ghana been addressed yet? I came here uh, January 2015 to set up a resident mission. So we have now dealt with the, the visa issues. It is quite easy to get a Namibian visa. The issue still is the, the promotional issues of Ghanaians knowing about Namibia and Namibians knowing about Ghana. The direct route will be Wintok, Lagos, Accra, effective March 24, four times a week. Apart from providing direct connection from Namibia to West Africa, the operation will further transport passengers and cargo on the Lagos Accra route. And to one of our developing stories, the Finance Minister Ken Oforiata will be dragging the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice charge to court over its handling of the conflict of interest petition in relation to the 2.25 uh, billion bond issue. Now he is heading to court to compel charge to overturn some of the declarations it considers irrelevant to the petition. Addressing a news conference in Accra Thursday, the Information Minister Mustafa Hamid said the Finance Minister believes charge went beyond the matter of conflict of interest to make pronouncements on other matters that was not seized with the capacity to make. Mr. Amit says Shraj went beyond its mandate to probe the conflict of interest claims by passing comments on the actual bond issue. Now, Shraj, whilst clearing Mr. Oforiata of any conflict of interest, said the finance minister failed to declare Data Bank as an asset to the Attorney General. And away from that, the Corporate Communication Director at the Ghana Standards Authority, Dr. Bidia Kwamponsa, wants beverage companies in Ghana to aspire to obtain ISO Food Safety Management System certification. He said this will increase their competitive edge and ensure they provide their customers with safe and quality food products. ISO 22000 2005 is a standard developed by the International Organization for Standardization dealing with food safety management. It provides a requirement for the establishment implementation, operation, monitoring, reviewing, maintenance, and improvement of documented food safety management system than is normally required by law for organizations to meet. The Corporate Communications Director at the Ghana Standards Authority, Dr. Bediaku Aponsa, said the certification ensures the elimination of incidents such as mishandling of raw materials, change in product formulation, inadequate maintenance, among others. It requires hard work, it requires persistence, it requires not just uh, training of, of personnel, but it also requires even the gadgets you use, the processes involved. All these things are very important. It's a very strenuous effort. Kasapreku Company Limited is the only local beverage company in Ghana to obtain ISO 22000-2005 Food Safety Management System Certification. The company was subjected to vigorous assessment by SGS auditors, the world's leading inspection, verification, testing and certification company. Uh, even though we have good quality systems in-house, we have a good quality safety team, um, we wanted an outside company with um, the international um, accolades to also come in and certify what we've already been doing, the good works that we've already been doing. Um, sometimes you cannot be um, the player and the referee at the same time. That's how come we went in for SGS to come and certify that Casper is now an ISO company. 
The managing director, Richard Ajay, said apart from enhancing its image and bringing it a competitive edge in the country and the sub-region, the certification also reinforces Casa Preku's willingness and commitment to providing safe and quality products. We started um, talking to bigger companies um, and shops in the US, South Africa and in Europe. Um, some of the shops that we started talking to, Walmart, ShopRite outside of Ghana, um, Costco's, and we started talking to local, local airlines as well as international airlines to um, take our product on board. And ISO certification certainly gives them the confidence that our product is of high quality. All right, so Ecobank Research has placed the city on a higher pedestal tonight. I'm talking about the city remaining stable to its major trading currencies, the dollar, the euro, as well as the pound. Uh, we understand that this would, could continue for the rest of 2018, looking at it remaining unchanged by 0% means it has remained stable uh, for some days now. For the city to the dollar, it's still at four Ghana cities, 42 pesos, when you're buying and when it's being sold to you. And the city to the Great British Pound, still at six Ghana cities, 27 pesos, when, you're, when it's being bought and when it's being sold at six Ghana cities, 25 pesos. Same for the city to the euro. And this has been attributed to the broad stability amid increased US dollar supply uh, from the research conducted by the group Ecobank, as well as well robust GDP growth and a trade surplus estimated at 2.3 percent. So for the city to the euro, still at five Ghana cities, 50 pesos. And we understand analysts are predicting that this trend is likely to continue in coming days, and they are confident that the local currency will do well against the greenback that is the dollar, the American currency. Let's see how this turns out for us as a country. But that will do for business tonight. My name is Naniki Amin Sanabrampa. Let's go back to them right there. Solis and Alfred. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Naniki. <laughs> we receive it too. It's grateful uh, for business. Let's go on to some other stories. The Office of the Civil Service is to secure more than 50 scholarship programs from the Hungarian government in the next few weeks. Now, the programs are to equip the capacity of the civil service in Ghana, especially in the areas of appraisal performance for civil servants. Head of civil service, Naneji Kumjamana, made observation during a courtesy call on him by the Hungarian ambassador to Ghana, Andras Zabos. Discussions centered on improving the capacity of civil servants to foster productivity in the service. Again, they focused on improving hard work and being assertive to promote government business. Head of the civil service, Nej Okum Jamna, was confident the Hungarian government could assist them effectively. And our reason for initiating this interaction, basically, is, is in the area of trying to improve the capacity. Capacity for the, as well as the civil servants or, or the staff are concerned. Then the other one is the improving the institutional capacity of our training institution. Hungarian ambassador to Ghana, Andreas Zabos, hinted at providing more than 50 scholarships to civil service to study in Hungary. We are here to, uh, to achieve uh, uh, beneficial uh, results, uh, mainly on different sectors where we can uh, offer, where we have something to offer, and uh, where we can uh, identify your needs. Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Saba Balo, said Hungary would increase its investments in water, sanitation, and other social amenities. Everything which is needed in the 21st century uh, for a modern uh, state administration. Go back with some sports news to stay. <laughs> The Kenyan government shutdown of the three largest private TV channels has been suspended by the High Court pending a full hearing. The channels were shut down as they planned to broadcast opposition leader Raila Odinga's unofficial inauguration in Nairobi. Mr. Odinga lost last year's election and his swearing-in was widely seen as a publicity stunt. Still more international news, still in Kenya, that directive by the courts to have those three stations uh, back on air has still not been heeded to. They're still off air. That's the information we're getting from that country.
of Kenya's largest private TV channels remain off air despite an order by the country's High Court suspending the shutdown. The government cut off KTN, NTV and Citizen TV over plans to broadcast opposition leader Raila Odinga's unofficial inauguration on Tuesday. The court suspended the ban for 14 days while the case is heard. When asked about the matter, Joseph Mocheru, the Minister of Information, Communication and Technology, told the BBC it was a security issue and that only the security minister could answer the question of when the stations would be able to broadcast again. Now let's do some entertainment news. And in entertainment tonight, the maiden edition of three music awards will be honoring the best fan army in Ghana. Now, these groups include the SM Life for Life, uh, BIM Nation, Sark Nation, and a few others. Now let's find out exactly what BIM Nation and uh, SM loyalists are saying. The fan army phenomenon has become a core part of the music business in Ghana here and to a large extent the success of an artist could be tied to how strong and loyal his fan base is. This is where we're coming to you from, Nima and the people here call the place the Dancehall City and when you're looking for the die-hard Satawale fans, this is where you're going to find them. Like you can see, I'm back. This is the SM logo bodily designing on the wall and it tells you where we are coming from. We'll be interacting with them and we want to find out what they think of the latest innovation, the Fan Army Award category in the three music awards. Shatter Movement Alliance. SM for life. Your member about Shatter Movement and not say Shatter. Roll it up everywhere, man. So me want me want Bim Nation crew if you understand say Shatter. I him take over. I him let dance and roll it up in Ghana, out of Jamaica. Every rascal that you know say what Shatter the teacher in a dancer. You understand? We have Sack Nation. We have Bim Nation. We have SM Movement. We have Gadam Nation and we have the High Graders. Tell us why. The Shatter Movement family is the finest. Why do you think is the finest? Shatter Movement City and Shatter Movement Alliance and SM family are the baddest, you understand, baddest family in the whole wide world. Tell somebody them if you understand this because Shatter, I him make dance, you know, sat off with a blood clot youth. Me tell you this for Mike. Let me tell him on. Some youth have, have to speak the truth, man. Even though the Beam Nation Debia, but shut and make everything, you know, public and man. I'll go for uh, SM. What? But not, yeah, I have a reasons. So you yeah, because, you know, he is for the ghetto. He sings for the ghetto and he sings direct like he's talking to us. Stoneboy is a professional. He's also good in music. I like his music. I won't lie to you. But when you talk about Shata, he's somebody who enters the ghetto. He comes to us, you understand? He sings and his, most of his songs are like he's talking to us. We are far, far ahead. You can't compare Ajiman Bedou to Lionel Messi. There's no way. Bim is a free aqua, Sako there is Ajiman Bedou and Shatawali is Messi. Interesting, interesting, interesting there. What mm. army do you... Um, no, no, well, we're, not, we're not doing this. Not on live television. Thank you very much for staying with us here on uh, News 360. Oh, well. My name is Solis Rose Corti. <laughs> and my name is Alfred Akatsi. She's running away. <laughs> but only we help the rest of the team. We're grateful. Have a good evening.